This is Tech Years, my name is Levi, and today I actually wanted to test the quality of your APS-C sensor line from Sony, or their newer one from the FX30 and 6700, to really the cream of the crop, the 12 megapixel sensor found in the A7S III, the FX3, and then now the somewhat budget ZV-E1. So I wanted to look at the a little bit of the low light performance, but also the quality that you're getting from the 4K that's not really oversampled, which it is on the FX30 as well as the 6700. And then how much of a hit do you take when looking at dynamic stability as that crops in? And then finally, uh, how good is the 1080p from the ZVE1 when that is oversampled 4K? So we're gonna dive in, look at some video footage, kind of freeze frame it, take a look and compare, and uh, hopefully help you guys make a decision on what would be best for your video content. Everything was shot at ISO 800 at S Cinetone with the 11 1.8 millimeter lens shot at F 1.8 at a 1 50th of a second. So just to give you an idea, everything was equal. All right, so first we're looking at the FX30 in 1080p. This is just standard. It looks okay. It is really not that great, but obviously it gets the job done. All these footage, we are gonna punch in 200%. And this is where you really see kind of that image breakdown. The 1080p on APS-C sensors from Sony has never really been that good. You almost have to go to the full frame line to get decent 1080p. So this is our baseline. This is probably the worst of the bunch. Now we're looking at the 4K footage from the FX30. This is downsampled from 6K. This is the second best you can get to the a7 IV, which is downsampled from 7K. And you can tell as we're going to punch in here to 200% that it is super sharp. I mean, even at 200%, it looks great. And the FX30 does have a, a look to it. Now, I didn't do any color grading. This is just S in the tone, color straight out of the camera, just modify for lighting a bit because this is a little bit darker lit situation. So we're gonna step up to the ZV-E1 now. Now, throughout these images, I am using the 11 millimeter 1.8 super wide angle here. You can tell the difference between FX30 and the full frame. So because of that, even though I'm gonna punch in 200%, I did do a reframing here. And obviously this is still 1080, but it just looks really sharp. So 1080 at 200%, there we're getting almost the same image that we did of the FX30 at that 1.5 crop. Uh, so I'm gonna reframe it, and it does look a little bit weird, but if I don't reframe it, just go into 300%, that still looks about the same as what we had at 200% in the 1080 from the FX30. So you can take a look here. I would almost still take the oversampled 4K 1080 footage at a 300% crop over the APS-C 1080. All right, so this is reframed. Obviously, this is an 11 millimeter lens at a full frame, super wide. I'm kind of distorted when I put it to a similar uh, distance. And at 200%, you can see that is a huge jump in quality where that just looks really sharp to me. And again, let's compare that to the FX30. Night and day difference. Huge difference. The 1080 is a drastic step up on the E1, and that's because it is oversampled from 4K. All right, so now we're gonna dive in. We're gonna look at how much of a hit does it take when you start putting these crops in. So this is 1080p with a dynamic 30% crop, which again, framing-wise, looks fairly close to APS-C, just a little bit wider. Now, once we punch in 200%, you're gonna notice that it still looks pretty good, but as people have guessed, it does look a little bit worse. It's not quite the same image quality, but I'm gonna still say it is drastically better than what we're getting the 1080 from the FX30, even at 300%. You can see here, which is a huge crop if you're using 1080, probably something you don't wanna do unless you're in 4K or even 8K. So now we're gonna go to 1080p from the Sony ZV-E1 
in Super 35 mode. So this is actually fairly equivalent to what we're getting in the FX30, right? This is, I'm not sure if it's oversampled. So that's something, let, let's take a look here. Framing wise, exact same spot. It's gonna look very similar to the FX30. When I punch in 200%, man, it's close. So just looking at that, please, I am recording this in 4K as far as exporting it, you guys can judge. Still looks better than FX30. Obviously we can see here, drastic improvement. Regular 1080 looks better than that. I don't know if the Super 35, the dynamic is a little better. Let's go back to the dynamic at 200%. And man, it looks okay. I think the Super 35 does look a bit better. Now this is me reframing it because obviously that 11 millimeter is super wide and you can see how crisp that regular 1080 is. All right, so this is worst case scenario. This is 1080p in Super 35 with dynamic. So we're really pushing that 12 megapixel sensor and we're gonna punch in here in a little bit. I think even this looks decent, but obviously you can tell this is not 4K, but I still think it's fairly pleasing. And again, we are now just one step above the FX30, but it's still a better image. You can tell it's starting to break down just a little bit, but even at 200%, this is a lot of cropping we're doing. And yeah, you, you can just tell right there, the colors, the graininess, just the sharpness, everything's super soft. So it, no matter what you're shooting, 1080 is going to be better on the E1, and you can take advantage of a lot of those settings. So we can definitely tell. Now we're just going to do an image, 1080p, 200% versus the E1 at 1080p. Now it's the E1 with dynamic. A little bit of a hit there. And if we look at Super 35 versus Dynamic, I think the Super 35 actually looks a little bit better. And then obviously we have the E1 Super 35 with Dynamic. And you guys can be the judge there. All right, so let's look at the 4K. This is something that you guys really wanted to judge. The E1 4K is pretty much just straight 4K image. This is not oversampled, I think it's 4.2. So versus the 6K, let's see how it looks. Let's see how much of a hit dynamic stability takes from it. Now, if we jump into 200%, oh, so actually I did want to reframe that because that E1 is the 11 millimeter so far back that I did want to reframe it. Again, it looks a little weird with this wide of a focal length, but when you crop in the 200%, it's not quite the same, but even at 200%, man, it's a sharp image. It looks great. It's 4K. So this is a straight 4K, even at 300%, that looks probably close to what you're getting from 1080, which is about what that math looks like. Now, this is with the reframing, having that closer image at 200%, you can still see how sharp that is. And man, that... So once you look a little closer, yes, the FX30 is a little bit sharper. And it should be, right? That's downsampled from 6K. But it's pretty close, guys. I don't think you're going to lose any customers, lose any sleep. You're going to feel bad about using the ZV-E1 versus the FX30. So, yeah, that does give you the idea of how good that 4K is coming from even the APS-C sensors. So this is what we came here for, the 4K with dynamic. This is technically a 30% crop, so the framing is really similar to what we're getting from the FX30. Let's take a look here. Obviously, regular framing. This looks solid, really clean. And then once we punch in the 200%, we're going to be able to kind of compare back and forth and see what you guys think. So I'm going to be the first to say, even at 200% with a dynamic, it does look a little bit worse. Yeah, indefinitely. 
you can tell right away this, the APS-C sensor with that oversampled 6K does start to look pretty sharp, but man, I don't know if it's a huge difference, but it's definitely something you notice from 200% zooming in. You can kind of start to see those details. Regular viewing, I don't know if it's going to be a huge difference. And I don't know why, to me, the FX30, that image just looks a little bit more filmic. Maybe it's the way I colored it or how the colors come out of the camera. But you're going to see here, again, you have the FX30 in the left and the E1 4K in the right. Again, these are just freeze frame shots. And then you have the dynamic steady shot cropped in. It's close. It's close. I'm not going to lose any sleep. I know a lot of folks were saying, hey, if you're going to use the dynamic steady shot, why don't you just get the FX30 and or the 6700 for that matter? I think the big difference is going to be by using the dynamic steady shot, you are getting, again, super stable footage where you almost don't need any kind of gimbal, depending on what you're doing, especially for walking backwards and forwards, for kind of panning. Uh, I think side to side, having a gimbal still makes a difference, but handheld, really, really big difference. Now, I did also want to put these two to the test. The reason you have a full frame sensor, the reason this 12 megapixel sensor from Sony is so amazing is not its low light image capability where people try to say 12 megapixels is, isn't any bigger than the 61 megapixel and low light's the same. No, for video at least, it makes a huge difference. So right now we're going to look at a really poor scene. This is not a typical low light scene. The low light I guess, images I have gotten from the FX30 on a dance floor. Uh, I had a birthday party we did. The FX30 with Fast Primes 1.4 was fantastic. I was able to get way better low light images that I was really happy with versus anything I got from prior sensors from Sony. That new 26 megapixel sensor is still very good in low light. It is not a full frame 12 megapixel A7S III FX3 E1 competitor, but it's still really good. So depending what you're shooting, you might be happy with this. So take a look at this scene. I'm literally in pitch black. This is what I see. I try to expose this for my eye. No light here whatsoever. Never do this. Obviously you're gonna to wanna to light your scene in some facets. So, okay, this is not a very realistic test, but just wanted to show you the capability of the sensors. So first we're doing the FX30. This is at 12,800 and you can still see me. Again, this is pitch black. Now I, forgive me, I did not tap on my face for image tracking, so it was kind of hunting. That is not the autofocus of the FX30 I was using. That's my fault. But I just wanted you to see how well it can expose. The light you're seeing is purely from the camera uh, screen. This second image, I did use some denoise. I did sharpen it a little bit and then brighten it in post. For how dark it is, and you guys saw how dark it was, that image is way more usable. Again, if I would have focused on my face, I think it would have been 10 times better than on the background there. But I was happy with that. And then you look at the E1. It's ridiculous. All that light is from the screen. Again, this is just a camera screen. And you can just tell it, it's not even close. Now on the E1, I did not tap on my face either. So you still see it kind of pulsating or kind of finding me there, but we are well underexposed. Now I actually did use some denoise. I sharpened, I brightened the colors, and all of a sudden we have a perfectly usable image at 25,000 ISO that again is not perfect, but this is an image that I've taken with zero lighting. It, you, it is super impressive. So when you talk about the low light capability of what you get from the Sony ZV-E1, it is incredible what you can get in almost complete darkness. It is shocking. So if you have any kind of light, I have a small light source here, you're fine. You can bring with you any type of little LED and you can definitely set the stage, set the image. Now you bring proper lighting, even more so it's gonna work. Now the FX30 and the 6700, not as good, but still really impressive. And just like anything else, 
as long as you expose properly and you bring some kind of lighting, you use what is available to you, you bring what you're able to, it's still quite impressive. So low light capability, that's where the ZVE-1 really kicks it up a notch, as well as the ease of use and using the camera to get a good image, no matter where you are. Like you're gonna be able to find a way to make a usable shot. And you saw there, even in pitch black, get an image that's still usable, that looks pretty good. So if you're in a well-lit studio, maybe you get the 6700, get the APS-C. The 4K looks amazing on it. The E1 still looks really good. So I don't know why anybody would pick the 6700 over the E1 if you need the low light, if you want that full frame look, if you want the benefit of actually having a smaller body. So there's a lot of advantages, but at $800 more, you really just have to look at what are you using it for. If you're doing wildlife, if you're doing sports, if you're doing more photography, of course, if you're using this more in a studio setting, all these things, the 6700 at $800 cheaper is still really impressive and it's 4K is beautiful. It's some of the best out there, no matter how much money you want to spend. Now, what I can say is I record most of my videos in 1080 because the image on the ZV-E1 is oversampled and you saw the quality on it. It is really close to 4K, obviously not up to par, but once you add in YouTube compression, once you even compare it to anything even close, the 1080 on the E1 is amazing. So that's what I've been really comfortable using. And the fact that then I can use Super 35 mode, Again, you have a little bit drop in quality, but it gives me a little bit more reach if I'm using Prime, so I can have a really light setup, and I will jump into that and some of the ZV-E1 uh, advantages you have versus any other body, uh, camera body in the industry. But hopefully this video helped you out. Rewind it, go through it, freeze frame it, put in the comments what you think works, didn't work, or how I can add. Guys, hopefully this helped you out. This is Levi with Tech Gears. Really appreciate you, and I'll come at you later.